Uh, so as an intro to what we're, we're doing here today, um, this is the last webinar of the webinar series that uh, Healthy Waters Laclavish has been putting on. Um, so uh, it's been a great series and I've uh, really enjoyed all the guest speakers that we've had uh, on lots of different topics from um, from planning and politics type things all the way to more practical things about how to um, how to restore riparian areas. So there's been lots of great um, sessions and I would encourage you guys to keep your eye on the Healthy Waters Laclavish uh, YouTube channel if you missed any of those and you should be seeing uh, those webinars um, start to show up there. There's, I think there's at least one of them up and there will probably be more of them up uh, soon. Um, the next thing I thought I'd intro is myself. So uh, yes, my name is Mike Schultz. I am the president of Healthy Waters um, and uh, I am also a instructor in the Natural Resource Technology Program here in Lac La Biche. Um, at Portage College. I have a big background in doing ecosystem mapping and so that includes wetlands mapping. Uh, wetlands have always been a uh, part of our big environmental assessments and that's where I did um, most of my consulting work when I was working as an environmental consultant. Uh, and uh, and then uh, I have used, as far as wetland classification is concerned, I have uh, used extensively five different wetland classification systems over the years uh, and I currently teach three different wetland classification systems to my students in, in my my water and wetlands class um, at Portage and so yeah so I have a pretty good familiarity with these classification systems as well as the laws that surround wetlands. I also teach environmental law um, and um, have worked on lots of different permitting and um, reports and whatnot for uh, various clients uh, from everything from uh, companies putting in a, a parking lot to uh, coal mines and, and uh, you know, really huge projects. Uh, so I have a master's degree in ecology and I, I did my master's actually studying fungi, the ecology of fungi. Uh, decomposing cattails, but uh, quickly moved into the area of um, sort of botany and ecosystem mapping, and career-wise, because I couldn't find couldn't find work in in mushrooms and fungi, so I, I went with my other passions, which is just uh, you know plants and ecosystems, and I'm kind of a general general naturalist. I consider myself. So that's a little bit about me. Um, so feel free to ask any questions again using the chat as we go through today's presentation and I'm going to share my screen with you. So that you guys can see that. All right, so I'm just moving some things around here on my screen. Uh, I hope you guys can see my wetlands and you screen. It says I'm screen sharing, so it's good to go. And I'm just gonna make my grid a little bit bigger so I can see all your lovely faces. And thank you, those of you who are uh, have chosen to uh, to let me see your faces. Much appreciated. All right, so the outline of today's presentation is uh, what's a wetland and so we're going to talk about some definitions. How do we define what a wetland is? Um, then we're going to talk about some uh, functions and values. So why are they important? Why do we have all these laws about, um, about wetlands and, and what's the deal with that? And then we'll go into some of those important laws that have to do with wetlands and then the most important part is uh, what are the wetland types? Um, and so we are going to be doing a quiz at the end. Uh, so you guys are going to have some 
pictures come up and you guys have to determine what kind of wetland the picture is showing, if it is a wetland or not. Uh, and uh, we'll see how you do. The winner will get a prize, but you guys have to like keep track yourselves because I don't have that advanced polling that it allows me to keep track of everybody's um, answers. All right, so, so that is what we're gonna be doing today. So here is, there's uh, lots of different definitions depending on who you ask of what a wetland is. Uh, but the Canadian definition is, uh, is uh, that a wetland is land where there's water at, near or above the surface, um, or which is saturated for a long enough period so that it promotes features like wet altered soils and water tolerant vegetation. So you kind of notice there's three elements to what might be defined as a wetland. And you only have to have one uh, that you can actually see for it to be a wetland. So the first thing is water. So you have to have water at, near, or above the surface. So notice that near is a possibility. You don't have to see water in order for it to be a wetland. In some wetlands, um, you really never flood that you actually see water at the surface. Um, but most of them at some time of the year, you will see some water at the surface. Um, there are, as you can see, some a couple of other definitions up there, um, one for the US and uh, one that is from uh, the Ramsar Convention, which is an international convention uh, on um, that has um, counted as a signatory to, whereby certain high value wetlands are, um, are able to be conserved through the um, provisions made in that convention. Um, the Ramsar includes some, def some definitions that include some classifications of, of different types of wetlands, such as marsh, pen, fen, peatland, or water. Um, it also includes artificial ones in the Ramsar definition, and it also includes ones that are salty, so um, things like the, um, the estuaries that are around, uh, uh, or around the shorelines of, of the ocean are also considered wetland. Um, but the definition uh, in, in Canada, as far as the depth, uh, it, all the wetland classifications we use is if it's two meters or more deep when, at the normal water line. If it's more than two meters deep, then it's not considered wetland. It's just considered an aquatic ecosystem. But if it's two meters or less deep, then it is considered a wetland area. So it's kind of key that it has to be a transition zone and not a fully aquatic zone, um, but not, of course, a terrestrial zone either. Uh, Ramsar Convention, it actually uh, includes low tides uh, not exceeding six meters. So that's a, a much higher depth that they allow for it to be still called a wetland. So I like this diagram that like, kind of shows what is uh, a wetland and what isn't. So um, here we can see um, water that is over two meters deep is considered an aquatic ecosystem and so it's not considered a wetland. Then we have these transitional areas like here and here from where it's two meters deep and that's generally where we're going to see the edge of aquatic plants being present whether they're uh, maybe floating plants or submerged plants um, and, and that's the sort of deepest part of the wetland and then the shallowest part of the wetland well um, what we're going to be looking for where the shallowest part is where we have the end of water adapted or wet altered soils or water adapted plants and wet altered soils being present. Um, another term that you'll often hear thrown around with regards to wetlands is riparian areas. So riparian areas include the entire wetland area, but then they also include um, a much broader upland area. So riparian area is not synonymous with a wetland. Um, they also include a lot more transitional upland area, but they do include again the entire wetland. And so 
course on this wetland then we've got another or this system here we've got another wetland zone here another riparian area zone here notice that the slope has a big role to play on how big a wetland zone might be if we had a super steep slope we might not see any wetland zone or not much of a, a riparian area but um, the sort of more gradual the slope the more we're going to see of wetland zones and of riparian zones. So what's what's it like in Canada for wetlands? Where do we have wetland sort of hot spots in Canada? So in this uh, diagram here we can see the um, darkest colors of blue are areas of land that have lots of wetlands in them and then going to lighter and then to white in areas that don't have many wetlands at all. Uh, so you can see a huge amount of wetlands uh, surrounding the Hudson's Bay area, a um, lot around Lake Winnipeg, but then we also have another hot spot and that's right here in northern Alberta. Lots and lots of wetlands in northern Alberta. We have areas of land where we have, you can see um, the darkest blue is 70, uh, 76 to 100 percent wetlands. So we've got areas up in northern Alberta that have, yeah, over 76 percent of the land is made up of wetlands. Um, and those areas are primarily peatlands, going to be bogs and stuff, and often th those northern ones will have even permafrost present, which is pretty cool. Um, so uh, as we move further south in Alberta, we uh, of course do have the wetland number of wetlands on the landscape slowly decline, but we still do have a fair amount of wetlands in most of the province um, when you consider the amount of land uh, that's got you know blues to darker blues in here. All right, so. Why do we care so much about wetlands? So prior to the 80s, um, there was actually laws that, uh, in, that paid farmers to, um, to drain wetlands. So what's up with that? Why are we now saying, you know, it's illegal to drain wetlands when we used to pay people to drain wetlands? So it, a lot of it has to do with our realization that these wetlands actually are performing some really important functions for us. Um, so what are those functions? Um, and so that's what we'll go through next. We're also gonna be using the term values and contrasting those to the functions. So the functions are the things that it's actually doing and the values is the kind of the human centric thing. What do I get out of it? All right, so um, we'll look at a bunch of functions and then say, what are the values that we get out of those functions? Um, so um, uh, when you think about the functions uh, and uh, that a wetland performs and the value that that gives to society, <clears throat> the average wetland um, throughout the world actually has a value of $22,000 per hectare per year. Uh, so that's if we took all those functions that a wetland does and assigned a monetary value to it of what it would, how much it would cost for us to replace those functions. Yeah, $22,000 per hectare per year. That's a lot of money. Um, of course, it's going to be different in different parts of the world in areas where wetlands are more sparse. They're going to have a higher value, relatively speaking, in areas like in northern Alberta. Uh, where we just got tons of wetlands on the landscape, then the value of an individual wetland would be quite reduced. So uh, some estimates I found for the average Canadian marsh wetland um, is about 58,000, for me, 5,800 um, per hectare per year. Uh, the the uh, benefits that those wetlands provide um, but that same area, if, they, if it was to be drained and cropped, would only net the farmer about $2,400 per hectare a year. So not even half of what the, um, the values that it, it provides as a natural healthy functioning wetland. So why then, you know, you, would you think that farmers would, would be doing this? It's because they don't see that money. 
they do see the $2,400, but they don't see the $5,800. They don't see, they don't get to collect on the benefits to water quality. They don't get to collect on the habitat for ducks and other things that we as Albertans enjoy when uh, when we have conserved wetlands on this, the landscape. So that's why farmers are still doing that all the time, um, draining wetlands and and um, creating um, and creating more farmland for themselves out of it because you know that money doesn't doesn't materialize for them um, as easily and as visibly. Although they do benefit from having it, for example, um, having it as pollinator habitat, which helps their crops if they if they are putting in crops that um, that require pollination. Uh, having wetlands on the landscape will help their crops to grow more effectively and help their um, water tables to be more uh, stable and a number of the, the benefits we'll see um, do apply to you if you are a wetland owner for sure too. All right so the first value that we're going to or function we're going to talk about is the function of water filtration. So wetlands kind of act like a sponge in that they are filtering stuff that's coming through them. So they're filtering out sediment, they're filtering out bacteria. Um, we're really worried when we're talking about lakes about excessive amounts of nutrients and wetlands do a great job of filtering those nutrients. And they also filter out nasty stuff, toxins that are entering our water supply. So how does that work? How do wetlands do this? Well, a lot of it has to do with the simple slowing down of the water. As the water slows down when it gets into a wetland or, or moves under the ground in or, or close to the ground, uh, then the sediment and bacteria are just physically settling out. But also the fact that we have shallower water allows for UV rays to penetrate a lot more effectively. And so those UV rays then can kill some of the nasty, you know, potentially um, um, stomach ache causing and whatnot bacteria that might be in the water. Um, and other little critters in the water, little microscopic organisms are also gonna be out there chowing down on bacteria and other things that might make people sick. Um, when we're thinking about thinking about the the excess nitrogen and phosphorus, a lot of that is removed again by the settling out, but also uh, the subsoil itself. Uh, the the soil is able particles are able to grab onto so a lot of these pollutants and uh, and nitrogen and phosphorus, and they are able to bind them up. And plants themselves are able to absorb some of these things and uh, and turn them into the plant's own tissues. Um, toxin removal is a really interesting function of wetlands. So um, again, it can happen just from settling out of the water when we have um, toxins that are as part of sediments, um, then uh, we can have those settling out. They also can be absorbed by sediments or plants, but also when we slow down the water, the water has a chance to, um, to stabilize and when it's running things that are dissolved in the water stay dissolved including nasty things like gasoline and other organic toxins you know pesticides that sort of thing in the water when we get into a wetland we slow it down then we have a chance for that water to separate those things to separate and then we have the the things that are volatile the things that can evaporate they'll be able to move to the surface and evaporate off into the air and not be in the water anymore um, some toxins are also broken down or modified when a, when it's slowed down and it's exposed to the organisms in a wetland. Metals are usually most toxic when they're in a reduced state. Um, and so when they're oxidized and they're combined with oxygen, then they generally are much less toxic, if not um, actually becoming completely non-toxic. And so these heavy metals like we get iron and aluminum and other things that are uh, actually quite dangerous when they're in that reduced state when we have too much of them. Now we get them in a wetland, they're slowing down, they're able to combine with the oxygen and now they're, they're not toxic anymore. 
and lots of the organic toxins in the water, the ones that even the ones that don't become volatile, will slowly get chowed down by bacteria and uh, fungi in the water um, that are able to to break them down. So what values do we get out of this toxin removal and about this all this water filtration? Well, of course, we get clean water out of it. But when you think of clean water, you think, well, drinking water and, uh, well, it comes out of my tap and we treat it, so what's the big deal? Well, when you think about clean water, though, it's not only just for drinking, um, it's also for recreation, for swimming and other recreational uses. And it's also great for the fact that now we have clean water for any animals in the environment to drink. So whether or not we are looking at fish or wildlife, nobody likes contaminated meat. Nobody likes having um, fish that are, um, you know, deformed or having problems. So we, have, we also get this clean water for the fish and for the deer and for all the other organisms in the environment that we may value. So the next swing is it acts as a nutrient source. So this is kind of a very interesting thing. So when we think about nutrients, we in, in regards to water, we're generally thinking, yeah, we want no more nutrients. We want the nutrients reduced because there's too many and they're causing eutrophication and algal blooms and all the nasty stuff that goes along with that. Um, but what happens in wetlands is these nutrients that would otherwise be harmful to our water now become beneficial because it now is, it, it, and all has to do with the form that these nutrients are in. So when they're dissolved in the water and in the forms that they are in the water, um, as, as um, you know, as sediment particles and things like that, they're not usable by most organisms. But now in the wetlands, they go undergo transformations and now these these nutrients are usable and they're, they can become hugely beneficial. Um, so um, what is happening here? Well, uh, organic matter has a chance to be decomposed. And so then we get, um, we get nutrients added to the system that way. And of course, animals are gonna be eating the plant material that the wetlands are producing. And now uh, the nutrients um, are in these organic forms and and are able to cycle back into the food chain and become moose and ducks and other things that we we value. And so then, yeah, the values, of course, is that now we have beneficial things that we can get out of it. Um, you know, the water that had these nutrients that we couldn't use now is a duck, now is a moose, now is things that we value, and um, now is a fish, uh, or is now a plant perhaps that we use, like, um, for those that are using plants uh, traditionally or, or going out and wild harvesting, like I like to do. Another really important um, function of wetlands is that they capture sediment. Um, and of course, we've mentioned that water in wetlands, you know, slows down and sediment stops, but let's think a little bit more about what the sort of down the line benefits of that is. So now we have the sediment that's not entering waterways. And so now our streams and our lakes also are lots not so cloudy and we're gonna have a much nicer water quality. Um, another thing is, especially when we have water acting as wet reservoirs that we use for getting water out of for our drinking water purposes or for irrigation or whatever, um, those over time, especially when we have, have size sediment loads, will get filled up and filled up and filled up with the sediment. And it's a, it's a major problem with a lot of uh, the water sources in Alberta. And so uh, when we have wetlands performing this function, now we have these areas that are no longer um, getting filled up as quickly. And so it could extends their, their life span. Another really important thing that wetlands are doing, um, especially on the, the ones that are edges, on the edges of water bodies like lakes and rivers and streams, 
um, is that they're holding onto the sediment there and that prevents erosion. And so by preventing erosion, then we don't get things like what we see in the picture here, right? Um, uh, we're not um, we're not having the edge of the streams basically ripping away at the land, <clears throat> and uh, and the wave action in lakes that would normally slowly wear away at the beaches and the shorelines are no longer being affected as much by having quality wetlands there. So I love this picture because it tells so many stories. All right, so look at this picture here. So first of all, the uh, first thing you're going to notice is that house is in a little bit of trouble. And it cer certainly is. But I also want you to look around the house and see if you can find, spot the cause of the trouble. Uh, why is it, why is there such a bad problem here? Well, the first thing I want you to look at is what is vegetation around there? Ah, so you see maybe a couple of shrubs around the house, but it's all turf, it's all grass, it's been mowed. But you look at what's below the grass. Look at those roots below the grass that are hanging out there. What's going on? Those are some huge roots for a grass, aren't they? <laughs> and those are not roots from the grass. Those are what used to be there. Those are the trees and, and shrubs that used to be there um, and used to be holding the soil in place and, and form the wetland and riparian areas. Also note uh, below the house that it's pure rock. There is no wetland zone down there. And so either it's been cleared or there's been so much erosion happening that it hasn't had a chance for a good wetland zone to form. So this person basically did it to themselves by cutting down the trees, by cutting down um, the shrubs and the wetland zone. They basically caused the erosion um, in, in many respects that is going to be the destruction of their own home. So here we can see some really straightforward values that we get out of having this uh, function of, of the sediment and particle retention, as well as, of course, that increased lifespan for our lakes and reservoirs, which we benefit from in many ways, such as getting water and recreational value out of them. Another really important uh, function of a lot of wetlands is uh, when we're thinking about global climate issues on a much broader scale is a function of carbon storage. And then along with that is how is it stored? Well, it's often stored in the form of peat. So um, peatlands do an especially great job at storing carbon. Um, peatlands like bogs and fens, and we'll talk about what those are a little later. And so, yeah, they're some of the ecosystems that do the most effective jobs of being a carbon sink. So they're just out there doing this great job of removing carbon from our atmosphere um, as far as per unit area. And so um, the value that we get out of this, of course, is when we're thinking about global impacts is providing offset for the greenhouse gases that we are producing and reducing the cost, costs and um, issues related to global warming and climate change. And we also get peat out of it. And so we can now, um, you can see in the picture there, there's that's a, um, basically it's a, like a giant vacuum that they use to, uh, to harvest peat. Um, so if you've ever bought uh, potting soil or um, peat for your, adding to your, your um, as a soil amendment in your garden, and you've benefited from a wetland. You've benefited from having peat as a, a resource that you, we can harvest. And in some parts of the world, they actually burn the peat as a source of energy and a source of warmth and heat. Okay, and so the next things we're going to talk about have to do with the water. Uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, some of the other things, but what about the water itself? What does it do in a wetland? 
Well, we did talk about wetlands being analogous to a sponge. So not only is it filtering stuff, but it's also absorbing the water itself. And it's slowly absorbing that water or it's absorbing large amounts of water when it comes in. And then it's allowing that to be slowly released rather than just being a big sort of flash flood type situation. Um, and so that is a, a huge benefit of having lots of wetlands on the landscape is the more wetlands, the more water we absorb when we have high rainfall events and when we have spring flooding and things like that. So major factor in flood prevention um, and it keeps the water um, after storms from being as rough and challenging as it can be. Um, it slows the water um, as, as it moves into the tributaries and eventually into the larger streams. And because it's moving more slowly, then it further helps to reduce erosion and siltation in addition to the wetlands actually, you know, kind of doing it physically. They're also helping on the broader landscape to reduce erosion by just slowing down how much water moves into our waterways. And it also keeps the stream flows from being um, really short. So if you've ever gone to a desert area, um, you know that when they have rains, they have flash floods. And you, so you get these, these channels that 90% of the time or more don't have water in them. How many fish do you think live in those channels? Not a lot. Actually, there would be a rough estimate of zero fish in those channels. Um, so when we have extended stream flows that is supported by having a good amount of wetlands, now we can have streams that are having consistent flows. So then we can, can provide fish habitat or habitat for many other organisms that rely on the water. Um, so that's the surface water. Now what about what's going on below the surface? So they also uh, help with uh, storing water and um, putting water into the subsurface, into what the term is aquifers. So that's basically water that's below the surface of the soil. Um, and so, um, so by recharging these aquifers, that gives us great groundwater. And if you happen to have a well on your property, you are relying on that groundwater and you need that groundwater to be present. Um, and so another thing benefit of having um, your groundwater being consistently present is of course it helps also with stream flows because a lot of streams are reliant not only on surface water but also on groundwater to keep consistent flows. So I like this little diagram that's in the, in the, in the corner just kind of showing how there are some wetlands just depending on how they are in the landscape and actually can change from um, time of the year um, which which way that they are, but um, some wetlands they recharge groundwater because they uh, take that water in that's from the surface, sit it, it sits in the wetland and then it absorbs. But then um, most wetlands are more discharges, so it's we have the groundwater close to the surface, and then we have these low areas. Now we've got a wetland, and now that water can turn into waters in streams and channels that is now usable. So what do we get out of these um, benefits or out of these functions of um, water storage in the surface and subsurface? Well, all you got to do is think about what happened in this picture. So this is Calgary uh, after the flooding and how many millions of dollars were cost, uh, were, were, yeah, did that cost? Like millions and millions of dollars. So if we had had more wetlands on the landscape, you know, even if, if the flooding was half of what it was, think of, well then half of those millions of dollars would have been saved if we had had more wetlands on the landscape or maybe even more. So this is a uh, something that says, a very one-time cost. Yes, insurance companies pay for it, but we all pay for it because we pay into our insurance companies. So 
Um, another benefit of that erosion um, prevention is, is making sure that we keep those good quality fertile soils. We could talk, give a whole talk on how our world is losing its fertile soil, soils. Um, but that's another topic uh, in and of itself, but uh, that is a huge benefit. Um, and of course, by maintaining consistent aquifers and maintaining consistent stream flows, now we have consistent well water that we can use. We have consistent stream water that we can use for watering uh, ourselves or our livestock or providing for fish or wildlife that we like and want to, you want to benefit from. All right, so we've talked about a few things to do with the water. Now let's talk about some of the organisms. So wetlands are very important for plant habitat and for plant biodiversity on the landscape. Lots of many species, lots of plant species and fungus and lichen species are in all these wetlands and they create the most biodiverse of all of the ecosystems in Alberta and they are among the most, they are the most productive systems in the world. That means that they're creating the most mass that is able to be cycled into the, new, into the ecosystem as far as how much biomass of plants are being produced per unit area. And we have many rare species in Alberta. Um, in fact, the majority of our rare species in Alberta that are partially or entirely dependent on wetlands. So what value do we get out of these wetland plants? Well, some are used directly either by people that are wild foragers and or native peoples. Um, rat root is a very common medicinal, medicinal plant um, and cattail was often the staple for most indigenous people as a source of flour. The rhizomes are ground for flour. Uh, the young shoots can be eaten as cooked or even raw. And, um, and other parts of the plants have many other purposes. So it was a really important species for them. Um, of course, uh, there is the aesthetic benefit here. So if you don't think, well, I mean, it's just how it looks. Is that really that much of a value? Well, go buy yourself a lakefront property and tell me, uh, is that aesthetic value worth something? All right, you buy a house on one side of the the road uh, away from the lake and it's 500,000 and the same house on the other side of the road is is a million dollars because because uh, it's got the lake view. So there is significant monetary value that people assign to having that aesthetics of having these beautiful wetlands. And of course being an educator we can't uh, neglect the fact that these have great educational value as I'm taking out students and teaching them all of the wonderful things about these plants. And here's just an example of a few um, rare wetland plants that are on Alberta's um, uh, species at risk lists. I'm not going to spend too much time going through that, but you can see um, three lovely examples. So the tiny cryptanth, the western blue flag, flag. and of course I can, I'm not going to ne neglect one of our only uh, uh, mosses, actually our only moss that is a species at risk which grows on rocks that are beside um, beside areas of flowing water and so it's a wetland species as well. So that's the plants and of course with plants comes the wildlife. Um, so um, there's lots of organisms that um, that live within wetlands and have extremely um, important or extremely high importance to um, all of the ecosystems um, that surround them. So waterfowl of course is a big one that's why Ducks Unlimited is one of the organizations that is involved with wetland conservation. Um, not only is it providing uh, direct habitat for them to survive but it also provides habitat and stopover areas for when they're on their migration. Um, lots of uh, birds and other birds besides waterfowl um, and fish and mammals and amphibians and reptiles and invertebrates are out there using these wetlands, very important um, uh, to then the surrounding areas too because again these are highly productive ecosystems that are able to 
take those nutrients and, and provide for a, a larger ecosystem. And when you look at species of concern in Alberta, those ones that are listed on our, our legislation, um, they completely, or almost half of them, completely rely on wetlands and a huge portion of the other ones uh, are using wetlands as a significant part of their habitat. So the values that we get for this wildlife habitat, of course, now we have some direct things that we can think of of doing fishing, of hunting and trapping. Uh, those of us that enjoy bird watching, you know that uh, you take your spotting scope and you go to a wetland area and you'll have half a day of fun just watching the, the different, um, different types of ducks and, and whatnot going around. Um, photography, most, if you look at the average beautiful photograph, you know, you're going to see water there. And of course, we have other values for recreation and education with the wildlife species. And here's just a, a list of the rare riparian animals. Uh, I'm not going to go through them all, but you can see there's everything from birds to, um, to fish to um, amphibians, even our um, Banff spring snail, which is one of our most threatened species in Alberta and actually one of the most threatened species in the world because it has such a limited um, limited area, only lives in hot springs in the Banff region. Um, if we're thinking about specific things that we can actually do and grow in wetlands, there are crops that are grown in wetlands. So cranberries, which contribute about $75 million a year to Canada's economy, um, are grown in bogs. Um, there's also, used to be a lot more wild rice in Alberta, um, but I'm, I wasn't able to find any numbers on it, but I can tell you that, um, that there is still wild rice being produced in Canada and it does contribute to our economy. and uh, they grow in shallow water wetlands. Other uh, wetland crops that you will benefit from is rice, if you ever eat rice. Um, that's all grown in wetlands that are usually artificially created. Um, taro is also a very important starchy food uh, around much of the world. And um, many uh, small organisms are farmed in wetlands, such as fish and frogs and crayfish and shellfish that uh, we may benefit from in going to the grocery store or otherwise getting our hands and stomachs on them. And there are other values besides these ones that wetlands provide. They can have historical values um, such as uh, archaeological values. In fact, uh, when you're doing an environmental impact assessment, you're often talking with peoples with different areas of expertise and you talk to, talk to the archaeologist and what area are they targeting and what are areas are they going to ask you as the ecologist to uh, help them find. It's going to be these riparian and wetland areas because people generally lived and worked near the water. So that's where we're going to probably find a higher chance of finding our um, archaeological resources. Um, there's lots of cultural values uh, besides just getting usage, uh, traditional use out of wetlands. Um, the First Nations people uh, often do and did um, value wetlands just and riparian areas and the water itself and giving even spiritual significance to the water. Um, many First Nations kind of view the water as being even alive in and of itself. And so uh, when we are polluting the water, we are hurting it in, in that sense. And of course, that aesthetic value, um, we kind of touched on briefly, yeah, it's a, it is a huge monetary value in our society when it comes to real estate. And, um, and of course, just the average person being able to go out and get the enjoyment of seeing beautiful, lovely, uh, healthy wetlands. So before we get right into the law, which I know most of you guys are here just because you love to hear about law. Um, the same thing with my students. They're like, Mike, why can't we learn more law? Um, 
But so before we get into that, um, why do we have these laws then that are so um, protective of wetlands in Alberta? Well, it's because we've lost so much and we're still losing wetlands. And we have, of course, now know all these wonderful things that they do for us. Um, so in the settled area of Alberta, we've lost uh, an estimated 64% and the climbing of our wetlands. Um, and even the ones that we do have left, a lot of them are degraded and unhealthy and are not able to perform the functions that they could do otherwise if they were in a, in a better state of health. Um, so that means that then um, either we do have to do man-made things to perform some of the functions that they um, they do. So uh, there is a huge amount of money, for example, in Calgary right now going into fixing up after the flood and trying to prevent floods from happening in the future. The massive amount of money going into that. Um, also for things like our water quality uh, that we don't get from the wetlands that have been lost and we have to um, install more water treatment plants and we have to put more chemicals in the water, which of course is not anything that anybody likes. Nobody likes chlorine and chemically water, but we kind of have to do that because we've been removing so much of our wetlands. Um, another thing that a lot of people don't recognize is, well, you know, we take out that wetland, you know, I don't think that it's going to cost that much. Well, that's because a lot of the benefits that 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 wetland performed are just lost and we never see them again. Right, you, you're, you're not going to be getting the salamanders and the ducks and the things that used to live in that wetland back. Um, so we are seeing massive species declines of insects and birds and many other groups all around the world. And it's because, yeah, they're, they're losing this habitat and they're just not getting it back. So we're just losing those from our world um, when, we're when we're losing wetlands. So this is a chart that shows about how much percentage of wetlands are lost in different areas of uh, Canada. So the Pacific, uh, of course, the ones that are the most affected here. Um, so the Pacific estuaries, these are these sort of sh sh uh, shallow sort of marshy areas. About 70% have, of them have been lost on the BC coast. Um, in the Okanagan valleys, you can see the highest amount that have been lost, mostly due to agriculture. 84 of the wetlands have been lost in those areas. On average, across the prairies, in those prairie prothole areas, we've lost about half of them. You can see southern Ontario, 72% of our wetlands have been lost. And uh, in the Atlantic, 65% of their salt marshes are gone. So this is not an insignificant problem. And this is kind of showing you what that looks like um, with regards, this is to do with more of the prairie prod holes. So you can see the landscape before and after agricultural development. Okay, so that's why we have laws in place to protect wetlands. All right, it's a significant issue. So there's two laws we're gonna talk about here. We could talk about more, but we're just gonna focus on two laws, the Public Lands Act and the Water Act and its associated wetland policy. So with regards to the Public Lands Act, a lot of people are familiar with the fact that it does um, protect and say that the province owns the bed and shore of all um, of all naturally occurring bodies of water. So we know that, yeah, the province owns a certain amount by the lake. But did you know that the province can claim if even on your own private land, if you have a little pond or if you have an area that has cattails in it um, and it's a naturally occurring area, the province can claim that as being crown land because all permanent and semi-permanent water bodies are technically um, belonging to the province. They may not claim them all the time. So generally, uh, if it's on your own private land, the province is not laying claim to that. But if you decide to 
affect it by creating a development or something like that, then the province can step in and say, hey, 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 no, 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 no. We, we're gonna claim that, we're gonna claim ownership of that wetland. Um, another thing is that whenever you have a, a, some sort of a channelized area where water is flowing or does flow for um, any significant period of time, that means that um, the province can claim that as well. So all naturally occurring rivers, streams, and water courses. And that water courses is very broadly interpreted to include any significant channels, even though they may not contain water very often. And so let's talk about these channels because they are also something that people generally don't have a great idea of. So uh, public lands can choose to claim any naturally occurring stream bed and all it has to have is it has to have a defined bed and channel. And so it doesn't have to have water currently present. So any naturally occurring channel could be claimed, could be called um, public land. Um, if they do choose to claim a channel area, they will send out somebody that will determine the legal bank, which is also determined by um, what the survey would find as the ordinary high water mark. And if public lands does choose to clean, claim a channel or a, um, a wetland or, uh, or other you know, area associated with an open body of water, they can just say, first of all, no, it's ours. You can't do anything to it. It'll prohibit disturbance. And that's if they're going to go through the bother of claiming it, that's usually what they'll do. Um, but they also have the ability to arrange for a land swap. If there's nearby land that public lands would like to get their hands on, they might do a land swap for that other area of land, or they can actually sell the area off. They're allowed to, but generally if they care so little about it that they'd be willing to sell it, they probably won't claim it. So that doesn't happen too often. So let's see what you guys think, which of these would be claimable under the Public Lands Act? So let's see if you guys, so let's start off. Um, so you can use just your thumb in your camera or you can use your thumbs up um, on the bottom of your screen under the reactions. So this one here, do you think Public Lands Act can claim that one? Say, so say a thumbs up or not. This is an easy one. So yes, most definitely that um, will be claimed by public lands and um, and they're gonna tell you not to muck it up. All right, almost 100% almost, uh, that that's what's gonna happen. Now, what about this one here? All right, would public lands act be able to claim that? So say a thumbs up or a thumbs down or that sort of thing. So what do you guys think? No, I got some as and I got some thumbs up and I got a thumbs down from Colin. Um, so Colin is correct. It is not claimable. Why? Because it is not a um, naturally occurring one. And so Public Sands Act will only claim naturally occurring areas. Now, the only exception to things like this, and there is an exception for that, and that is if people have taken a naturalized natural stream and channelized it, then potentially they might claim it because it's, it's, it's a derived from a naturally occurring stream. Okay. Hey, Michael, Michael yeah. if, if that ditch was a uh, naturally occurring stream and uh, changed course, yeah. Then would that be considered then something claimable because it was originally, or would it still be considered uh, a man-made? Yeah, then that's a tough one. But um, I have heard of examples where they have claimed it um, if it's been a, a natural stream that's been been rerouted, kind of to to make up for the stream that was lost otherwise. All right, so last but not least, we have this big one on the side. What do you think? That'd be claimable by public hands. Uh, give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Uh, so I got some thumbs up and I got one thumbs down. 
And, oh, and I, oh, come on, you guys got it. None of this. You got to give it thumbs up or thumbs down. All right. And the correct answer is yes, it is claimable. All right. Why? Because if you look right along here and it kind of curves around there, there is a defined bed. There is a defined channel. And so even that, even though there's no water in it, it can be claimed by public lands. And you can even see here, the water erodes away at this area here. So definitely um, showing evidence that there is water there, uh, at least for a time of the year. Michael, so like who determines that? Is there like water specialists or like people trained in this area that come out and designate these things? Like, Yeah, it's, it's kind of a challenge. Um, so often what happens on projects that I've been involved with when public lands is getting involved is very often uh, the landowner, somebody from the government and a surveyor go out and do this. And maybe a person who's a wetland uh, specialist is going to go out and they'll go together and say, okay, where do we think the ordinary high water mark is that everyone can be happy with? Um, but often it's done by surveyors, even though surveyors don't really have um, a huge amount of training in sort of the vegetation, which they ought to, um, often they are the ones that end up doing it. Great question. All right, so public lands hack. Now let's talk, we just talked about channels. What about the wetlands themselves? Uh, so um, if it is a semi-permanent wetland, that is, it has things like cattails, it has things like bulrushes, um, those kinds of plants in there that are indicating that it, water is around for a significant portion of the year. Um, so all of those can be claimed and often are. Um, seasonal wetlands, which are wetlands that have water less often, um, and they're going to be um, species like um, like slough grass or um, spike rushes. And anyways, there's a huge diversity of plants that might be in a seasonal wetland. They usually aren't, but because they're close to being a semi-permanent wetland, they have to undergo an extensive review to kind of prove how permanent the water is. Um, there are also salt marshes in Alberta, and those are another separate class of wetlands. Um, and they um, may be claimed, um, but that one has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. So lots of wetlands potentially claimable or at least have to be um, assessed very thoroughly to determine if they are going to be claimable. All right, so let's see what you guys think for these different ones. Okay, so let's start off with the top corner, start off easy. All right, do you think this shoreline area would be claimable by public lands? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Yeah, so I see mostly thumbs up and you're 100% right. That is definitely will be claimed by public lands. All right, let's go down from it. So we have this big broad area here. So it looks a lot like the area beside our independence store. Um, the areas that are on around the highway there where it comes close to the lake. Okay, what do you think? Is that claimable by public lands? Thumbs up or thumbs down? And correct. Oh, I see some thumbs up and some thumbs down. And thumbs up is correct. It is a semi-permanent wetland because we have lots of cattails. So those are strong indicators that we have something semi-permanent. So, and, and very often, especially larger areas like this will definitely be claimed by public lands. Okay, now let's go to the other top one here. So we have an area that looks fairly open and it's kind of got white and glistening-y soils. What do you guys think about that one? So I have some thumbs down. I have some not so much. All right, so that one is a salt marsh. So that one is a one that is potentially claimable, um, but it's a case-by-case -case basis. And then last but not least, we have this one here. So the area that is sort of greenish in the middle of this field. What do you guys think? Is that a potentially claimable public land as public land? What do you guys think? Yes or no? 
Is is that a floodplain, uh, or or is just just a prairie? <laughs> yeah, just kind of prairie. Probably a road is here because I can see a fence. Um, and you know, yeah, this one probably will not be claimed by public lands because it's not got permanent enough water. All right, so now you guys get have some ideas of what we mean by these different areas that may or may not be claimed. All right, so now we're going to go into our most um, wetland specific laws to protect wetlands and those occur under the Water Act. All right, so under the Water Act, the province owns all of the water in the province. You spit on the ground, it belongs to the province. All right. Um, and so uh, that includes not only that, but all the water in wetlands. So that's how the province can claim authority over wetlands because it owns the water in the wetlands, including the water that's below the soil, including the water that you don't see. So if you're doing something that's gonna affect that water, then you're going to be potentially under the purview of the Water Act. And so because of that Water Act, then we have to have approvals before we do any disturbances in any naturally occurring wetlands. Um, including wetlands that are on your own private land. And so the details about this are in our wetland policy. And so the wetland policy itself, its set goal is to conserve, restore, protect and manage Alberta's wetlands, it's to sustain their benefits for all of us. Um, and so the basic gist of the wetland, the wetland policy is whenever we have infilling or disturbance, a significant disturbance happening in wetlands, uh, it has to go through a provincial approval process. The purpose of that process is to reduce the loss of wetlands that we've been seeing in Alberta. And now we have to prove um, the policy has changed a lot over the last 10 years. And uh, then now we have to prove and provide rationale for either why we can't avoid disturbing a wetland. And if we can't avoid, why can't we minimize the disturbance of a particular wetland? And then the sort of last resort is doing a compensation process for, um, for disturbing those. But again, you have to show that you can't avoid or minimize. Um, so because of this wetland policy, whenever there is somebody's doing anything on the land that might involve wetland disturbance, they have to get somebody out there to do an assessment. And the kind of professional that um, is required to do that work is a qualified wetland and aquatic environmental specialist, a QUACE. Um, and so the QUACE has to come in um, with somebody that has that designation has to come in and map and determine the area. And then also there's a, a value that is now created that you have to do a, a value calculation for the wetland that is gonna be potentially disturbed. It's very important then that the mapping is done correctly um, because uh, when you think about a pizza, right? If you have a pizza that's a 10 inch pizza versus a 12 inch pizza, well, you're only adding two inches to the edge of the pizza, but you're adding probably well over double to the volume of pizza that you get. And so the determining those edges is a really key thing um, in order to make sure things are done properly. If we look at the, the little bottom picture here, um, the areas that are shown in color are a predictive model as to where the wetlands might be um, that's, that um, the Alberta government has created that you can use. But if you were to out, actually go out there and look at the actual wetland, you'd realize that's not a very good border for that wetland. Um, probably the border for this wetland is going to be sort of the edge of the plowed and probably a little bit into the plowed area based on my experience. Um, and so that would be the wetland edge and it wouldn't be separate these two, but they'd be connected to one another. So you probably end up with probably double the area of the wetland if you were to do a ground map versus what is shown here with the blue and the yellow. Um, so what's to do with the compensation? Um, it is the last resort, but it's still 
uh, it is still a resort. Um, so how is that done? Well, it's done by constructing new wetlands or else making improvements to existing wetlands. Um, and um, the policy says we try and if at all possible, create these new wetlands in the same general area in the same watershed and general region as the areas that the wetland has been removed from. So we're not getting, uh, you know, areas near Calgary, let's say, where it's hard to get land, you know, all the wetlands get taken away from there and then they're put into areas, say, in northern Alberta where land is cheap. Um, so when you go and do compensation, you have to pay for the land or pay for the wetlands you lose and where does that money go? Um, so this is a thing that a lot of people will use. That's so weird. People do this so often nowadays where they say, well, I don't know where that money goes. Therefore it goes into nothingness and it doesn't matter. It's just, you know, goes to, goes to, to, you know, some politicians pockets. No, that's not true at all. All right, so the money actually has to be paid either um, by a third party that has a wetland bank, so a, a comp, uh, an organization that's been doing wetland restoration and then um, they're able to, to accumulate a bit of a wetland bank. And so then um, if you're, you're a land developer or whatever, you wanna um, muck up some wetlands, okay, well, I'm gonna purchase some out of this wetland bank. Um, there's also an in lieu fee program that um, basically you pay a third party, somebody that's qualified to do this kind of work to do some uh, creation or restoration or enhancement of some wetlands. Um, or, and this is a fairly new thing, it's only been uh, uh, possible within the last couple of years, you can, um, provided you can show you're going to have somebody with the right expertise on board, you can do your own wetland replacement. But you have to do it within a very short period of time um, or even before the wetlands are lost so that we're not having a significant time lag between when we're losing and when we're regaining our wetlands. Um, technically too, the compensation can be non-restorative and be things for, uh, for research or education, uh, inventory projects, wetland inventory projects or stewardship pro pro uh, projects or long-term conservation projects. So technically money can go in there, but that's kind of um, a, sort of the least prefer preferred approach. And by the way, this is a, a wetland construction that's happening here. So how much does it cost? Everybody wants to know how much is it gonna cost me? All right, so this is the, the costs um, as of I think 2018. Uh, so in different parts of the province, the costs are gonna be different that you'll end up having to pay if you wanna pay into that in lieu rate that's basically governed by uh, the government and, um, and then paid out to appropriate people doing uh, restoration work. So if you're in the green area of the province, so any area here, it doesn't matter which zone you're in, but if you're in the green area of the province, the cost to you is actually quite insignificant. It's only $10,300 per hectare. All right, so that's not bad. Um, and why do you think that is? Well, because that's where the province does most of its work and it doesn't want to have to pay too much money. So at least that's my theory. All right, so you step over the green area border, you go from there to there, all right, five meters over the line, and now you're in the white area. And uh, then now it depends on which of these um, 21 zones that you're in. So depending on where you're at, it'll be anywhere from about $17,000 per hectare all the way up to about 19,400 for our more expensive areas. I think there's 19,400, so I think, yeah, that's 11. Where's 11 here? That's the most expensive area. Why can't I see it? Yeah, there it is. Oh, well, the foothills, that's interesting. All right. 
All right, so now we've talked about the law. Um, I could spend another probably half hour talking about the law, but I don't want to lose everybody here. Um, so now we're going to talk about the wetlands themselves. Um, so uh, why are there still such problems around wetlands? Well, it's because often people don't recognize what they're looking at and or um, there's not the enforcement out there to protect them. Um, a lot of people use different terms, especially farmers will use different terms for wetlands. They'll call it, oh, that's a low spot or a mud patch or uh, yeah, we got some ponding happening over there, right? Um, all those terms means you're dealing with a wetland. All right, there is a wetland there. It, it's uh, simple as that. I've had lots of people come to me and say, oh, I have this little low area and I just wanted to make it pretty. So what do I do? It's a wetland, it's not a low area, all right? And so, yes, it is protected, even if it's on your private land. Um, so again, these areas are wetlands, but they're often drained to make land usable for agriculture or for other purposes. And this is actually in Fairview County and somebody that got caught draining a very huge open water wetland or even probably part of that is a, a, a bit of a lake or pond. So this is before and this is that exact same area afterwards after they did the, the draining. So this is still happening all over Alberta. So even with the, um, the policy in place, we still are having a decrease in wetlands in Alberta. We're not seeing them being replaced. So technically the, the midpoint for wetland replacement, I, we didn't spend too much time about, is three to one. So for every hectare, you're supposed to replace three hectares. So if you're gaining, should be gaining two hectares for every hectare lost, then how come we're not seeing wetlands increasing? What's going on? Um, the problem is there's so, so many misconceptions. Even those people that ought to know what they're doing, people that are, um, you know, uh, working for Alberta environment, they don't, there are people that are doing these kinds of work. They don't even know how to figure out if an area is a wetland or not. They don't know what the different types of wetlands look like. And so that's what I'm, I'm hoping to, to cover a little bit of here. Um, but they probably, there are probably people there that um, won't think to think that they need an education on this, which is too bad. Uh, I'll just, I had a situation where there was a wetland uh, disturbance that I reported um, that I happened to know the person and, and they had, I had talked to the person and said, you know, that's a wetland area, you shouldn't be disturbing that. They went and disturbed it anyways. I reported it as I am required legally to do. Um, and, um, and the person from Alberta Environment came out and said, oh, that's not a wetland. The person was digging out peat. The only place we can see peat formed is in a wetland. And of course, there were other, lots of other wetland plants that were around that were a good indicator. So yeah, unfortunately, not even those in charge necessarily know how to determine what a wetland is. So um, a lot of times the treed wetlands and peatland peatlands are not properly recognized as being wetlands. And the fact that very often we have wetlands that are tilled or mowed, it still doesn't change them from being a wetland. They're just now a wetland that's being disturbed, but they still need to be compensated for and they still need to be protected. Of course, a lot of it is lack of education and also there's a lack of enforcement. Uh, generally, Alberta environment doesn't get involved unless somebody reports something. Um, they're not out there doing a heck of a lot of uh, hunting down people and looking on the landscape to see if stuff is being lost. So I'm sorry to say guys, but now that you've been in this webinar with me, you are legally responsible to report wetland losses that you see. And if you don't report them, hate to say this, but, and of course I only tell you this after, um, you could be charged for failing to report as well as the person that did the disturbance if they don't report it. So, haha, I just made you legally responsible for something. All right, and so we see lots of situations like this where we have wetlands that are being lost or degraded. Um, in, this, in this case, um, due to probably quads. 
we see situations like this where the loss of wetland areas is now contributing to significant uh, erosion and issues. So again, kind of further highlighting the importance of conserving and protecting and uh, maintaining, properly maintaining our wetland areas. So in order to do this wetland work, we, and to understand the different types of wetlands out there, we classify wetlands. Um, and so um, again, for the purposes of doing compensation as well as uh, academic study, uh, we will classify wetlands and um, allow us to be able to describe some of these different areas much more easily. Um, figuring out the classification of wetland, of course, is part of doing that wetland compensation work uh, and determining your values. So we are now gonna teach you the five classes of wetlands. All right, so I would encourage you to take notes because again, we are actually gonna have a quiz on this at the end and there will be a prize to the winner of the quiz. All right, so the first thing we have to understand is peat. All right, so what is peat? Because that's one of the things we use to determine the wetland class. So peat is made up of partially decomposed organic material. We'll only see it in uh, two and perhaps three types of wetland classes. And depending on which kind of wetland we're in, that peat might be made up of moss material, it might be made up of grasses and sedges, or it might even be made up of woody material. Um, just and, and of course, proportions of those will change in different types of wetland. Um, wet, or peat, if most people think, well, I add peat to my horticultural soil or to my garden, so it must be good in nutrients. Peat actually is not high in nutrients in and of itself. Um, the reason you add it is more for its water holding uh, capabilities, not so much for nutrients. That's why if you are growing in a very high peat soil, you have to add fertilizer to it because there's just not that much nutrients within the peat itself. So that's a common misconception about peat. Um, so uh, then we can define there are two major uh, kind of broad groupings of wetlands is peatlands, also sometimes called muskeg in a sort of the vernacular, and then versus our mineral soil wetlands. And so 40 centimeters is the line you draw. If you have more than 40 centimeters of peat, then you are in a peatland. If you have less than 40 centimeters, then you're in a mineral soil wetland. Um, Notice here, and this is kind of a cool photo, that we are still seeing some other indicators of wetland conditions in mineral soils. If you look down here, you see these rusty spots in the soil. If you see rusty spots that, is, that are quite easy to see with the naked eye, that's a surefire indicator that you're in a wetland area. Um, and that's called modeling. And you also notice further down here, you see a sort of a grayish layer. When you have these grayish stinkier soils, that's an area where water is so often present that it reduces the metals in the soil and that's a process called glaying and that is definitely if you have glaying you are definitely in a wetland even if the plants aren't indicating it the soil is telling you it all right so now we're going to go into our first wetland class so the first one air bogs so they are a type of peatland they'll have uh, at least 40 centimeters, often many meters of peat present in these wetlands, and the peat is mostly made from peat mosses. They are our poorest nutrient uh, wetlands. The water is not flowing at, at, at the surface or below the surface. It's only coming from rain and snow that's coming from above. Uh, indicator species that we would have here that would tell us we were in a bog would be these um, primarily Black spruce trees as being the main species present. That'll be relatively short and stunted. And we'll see plants like bog cranberry and cranberry, Labrador tea, a whole bunch of other plants in that same family, the Ericaceae. Um, so things like bog rosemary and, um, and leather leaf, there's a whole group of these kinds of plants. Um, under those then, what you normally see are peat mosses. Sometimes you'll see a certain amount of feather mosses. Um, and you often see lichens in these areas, particularly in more open, drier areas of a bog. 
uh, we'll see some lichen presence. And sometimes you'll see very old bogs that are completely covered in lichens. And lichens are weird to think. Why would you have lichens in a wetland when lichens are, the other place we see them are in like the driest of dry soils under pine trees and stuff and sandy areas. And it's because bogs will often be very dry at their surface, even though they are a wetland. And we'll talk about why that is um, in a second here. So some cool bog facts. I'll throw in some cool facts about each of our wetlands. Um, so uh, there aren't very many organisms that change their environment in a significant way to make it more suitable. Um, the beavers are ones, humans are definitely one, but another one is the peat mosses that grow in bogs. They're actually out there and they excrete antibiotics and they excrete acids actively into the water to slow decomposition. And that is what allows the peat to accumulate so effectively in these wetlands. Um, and so, yeah, so it does make it more challenging for other plants to grow in these um, bog wetlands, but there is still a huge amount of organism, a huge biodiversity in bogs no doubt. Um, and so why do we sometimes get these bogs that are actually really high and dry in the middle? Well it's because they can they can do something called doming where they're actually growing above the water level and significantly so. And the reason why is that the peat plants form a single long stem that goes all the way down 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 to the bottom of it. And so then they can wick the water up from, from way, way, way down. And so they, these peat mosses can keep growing up and keep growing up as long as they don't become broken in the middle. If you were to take a, uh, a knife and now cut these mosses at the top, they would die because they're no longer connected through that wicking system of their partially decomposed or um, you know stems that, that run all the way down. The individual peat moss plants are actually super old in bogs because they've been growing in these same areas for perhaps thousands of years old. Uh, those little moss plants are maybe thousands of years old, which is pretty incredible to think. Um, Uh, some other cool bog facts, because we are low in nutrients, we have to have some pretty amazing adaptations to be able to grow and survive. So all of the plants like the bog cranberries and Labrador teas and things, they have their own fungal associates that they grow with. Um, they're called the Iroquois mycorrhizae, if you want to know the fancy word for it. And it is a specific relationship between a group of fungi that actually normally doesn't grow in mycorrhizal relationships. It doesn't grow with other plants, but it's this very close relationship that's developed between these fungi that can actually grow and actually do a, a decent job of living and surviving in peat and helping the plants to absorb some of the nutrients that are present. Um, and so, yeah, so we have a very specific fungal association that many of these plants use. Others grow just very slowly. That's why black spruce can grow because it's able to very, um, very carefully regulate its growth so that it'll grow more slowly when it's nutrient poor and it can grow more quickly. It's uh, one of the few plants that can really do that super effectively. And of course there are some bog plants that say screw it, I'm getting my insects. I'm getting my nutrients from insects. And so they actually form things like our sundew plants uh, where they're actually got um, traps that they use to catch and act as carnivorous plants. So it's just pretty cool. And this, this little guy here, the round leaf sundew is a really common species in Alberta bogs, but he's really small. So most people miss him. All right, another cool bog fact is where we have northern areas. We can see um, uh, wetlands that have permafrost and bogs are, um, because of course water is not moving in a bog. If you have permafrost by nature, water's not moving in permafrost. So then we have bogs that, can, that will form in permafrost situation. And they're the only wetland that you'll see with permafrost. Um, and you often see these really cool features when areas of permafrost melt um, or formed because when it's when um, permafrost forms ice 
expands until then it forms high areas and so you see trees growing off of these very densely you'll see trees coming off of these higher areas even though they are nutrient poor but then you see those high areas collapse and then you have these big wet patches um, when the permafrost and uh, permafrost goes down that we, we call collapse scars and here we can see a, there's a guy standing there beside an area that used to be permafrost and then went down and now we've got this low area and that's called a, that's a, a beautiful picture of a collapse scar and here's some collapse scars from the, the surface view and you can see um, these these areas here this is northern mostly permafrost bog you can see how the trees are actually pretty tall and dense for any year average bog um, because of the higher situation we have with the permafrost uh, forming and then these collapse scars scattered throughout pretty cool landscape features i think here's an area that you know, is um, that the majority of the area has all collapsed and so then we have a lot of wet areas and then the areas that are sort of the islands here those are areas of the remaining permafrost bog that may have been you know more, maybe uh, a thousand years ago that was all permafrost bog but now it's like this all right and so for each of these wetlands we're going to talk about some of the issues that they face um, so because bogs are often naturally dry at the surface, um, when we're thinking about the effects of climate change, these are going to be disproportionately affected because now we have a dry surface that's getting even drier. And so uh, we may see the, the trees start to die off. We may see the other, the other plants start to die off because they're already living in a relatively stressful environment. Another unfortunate thing is um, we generally see much less value given to peatlands in general versus mineral soil wetlands, um, probably because ducks don't live in peatlands. Uh, I hate to say it, but for some reason ducks have a lot to do with wetland conservation. I'm not saying that ducks are bad, but. Um, and another thing too is forested wetlands don't tend to be recognized or uh, put the same uh, type of value on them uh, for um, for finding them and for conserving them, generally because we don't see the water at the surface in bogs. It's very, very common that we ha don't see water until we dig down for a good, you know, 40, 50 centimeters or more. Um, older bogs are very important habitat for caribou. They need those lichens and those older bogs are great sources of lichens, but the older bogs are also where we can get the deepest peat. And we do have peat harvesting operations in Alberta. There's actually a peat harvesting plant not that far from Lac La Biche here. Um, so, um, so there is a bit of a conflict there where we have these ones that are important for caribou, important wetlands, but they're also the best ones for peat harvesting. And um, when peatlands like, and especially bogs are, um, are destroyed, they, they've taken thousands of years of fo to form. There's no way that you're putting back that connectivity of the peat on the landscape. Even if you were to take a bunch of peat and dump it in an area and plant some black spruce, it would probably function more like an upland area. It wouldn't actually function like a wetland because you don't have the same connectivity, you don't have the same patterns of water uh, absorption and it, it won't work. And I've actually seen areas where people have tried that. Um, and and yeah, it, you just get, you just basically get what looks like an upland. All right, so that's bogs. So the next ones are fens. So fens are also peatlands, but they're gonna be higher in nutrients than bogs because we have moving water. So we might have some little streams or stuff at the surface, but more often than not, we have subsurface. So movement of water. So the water is moving inside the peat, far below where we can see it. And it's usually not like rapid flow, but it's gradual flow, what we call sheet flow of water. Um, so um, again, uh, they, they are a little bit more nutrient poor than mineral soil wetlands because they can't access the mineral soil unless we're, you know, right at the edge of where the, the peat is. 
common plants we have as indicators of fens are, uh, if we have a treed fen like we see here is tamarack trees. You can often see black spruce in there as well, and perhaps um, uh, birch. There are some fens that are more have birch in them. Um, and as far as the shrubs, we often have some shrubs and sometimes a shrub dominated fen. The, we would see um, species of a shrubby birch. There's bog birch and there's swamp birch, our common birch shrubs in our area, as well as different species of willows. Um, underneath those, we typically have a lot of sedges. Um, and that's one of the things I use a big indicator in the field for a fen is I look for lots of sedges. Sedges kind of look like a grass, but uh, if you have a stem in your hand and you rotate it, you'll see the, the stem of the sedges have three sides and there's lots more to identifying sedges, but we'll get into that. Um, underneath the, those sedges, we can see almost no mosses present. We can see aquatic mosses present, or if it's a poorer fen that's closer to being a bog, we can even see peat mosses present and other bog type species mixed in. So here's a picture of a shrubby fen and how we tell a shrubby fen from a swamp, because we also have shrubby swamps, is uh, the shrubs are less than shoulder height in a fen. If they're taller than shoulder height, then we would call it a bog, or call it a swamp. And there's a nice sedge fen with also some shrubby areas in it. So you can see there's kind of three forms that we can have. We can have treed fens, we can have shrubby fens, or we can have sedge dominated fens. Generally, the lower the vegetation is, the higher the water. So sedge fens are going to be the wettest, treed fens are going to be the driest. Some cool fen facts, we can sometimes see floating fens that form as a, a mat above the water. Um, you can sometimes see them kind of extending into a lake or sometimes they'll completely cover over top of a stream or a smaller body of water. And so you can walk in them and the ground's moving and moving up and down. Has anybody here been in a floating fen? Remember the first time I encountered it was when I was doing tree planting in northern BC and I had this long floating fan. I had no idea what I was dealing with. Back cover full of trees that I needed to get to that spot over there. I saw a brown spot and said, hey, there looks like something more stable. Don't step in a brown spot in a floating fan because it means something broke through there. <laughs> and so I stepped in there first thing in the morning, got myself and my trees completely soaked in water. It was not a fun day. Yeah, so you only see fens doing that. Another cool thing that we can see in some fens when we have a slope of about 2% and we have relatively thick peat, we can have a, a patterning forming. Um, and so we can get patterning fen, pattern fens. And so the high areas um, we call the strings and the low areas uh, we can call flarks. Sometimes the flarks will have water in them. And sometimes like in this picture here, we um, we don't have water in the flarks um, very often, but it forms these really cool patterns and these pattern fens are actually considered of a high conservation value uh, in and of themselves because of their rarity on the landscape. A very big one that's kind of under threat, but currently, but there are many people trying to get it um, recognized globally as a conservation area is McClelland Fen um, in, in Northern Alberta, if you wanna, look up McClellan Fen, you'll see some really cool pictures. I think this might actually be McClellan Fen if I remember correctly. But I've had numerous pattern fend in different projects that I've worked on as well. So they do they do occur um, here and there. Here's another nice pattern fen. You can see two levels of patterning, these broad patterns here. These ones, the flarks are filled with water. And then you can see a much finer patterning in this area below, which is pretty cool. I love pattern fens. You often find cool rare plants in there too when you're rare plant surveying. Yeah, you just like pattern fen. <laughs> and here's a nice pattern fen with water uh, from the ground. So what are some issues that fens face? 
Well, because fens are fens because of water flow and often subsurface water flow, um, any development tends to affect water flow in areas surrounding them. So you put a road in or by a fen, you're really changing the water flow and now that's going to change the species that are going to be present. You're going to make some areas more nutrient poor, some more nutrient rich, and so we're going to have significant effects on it. Um, Another thing too is we're talking about peatlands and again, treed wetlands sometimes. And so when we have those situations and again, we often have them unrecognized. All right, so now we've done bogs and fens. We're on to number three, the swamp. Welcome to the swamp, if you guys remember that old commercial. Um, so swamps can be treed swamps or shrubby swamps. Um, they can also have mineral soil or they can have peat, um, but if they have peat, it's generally shallow peat. They're often going to be quite high in nutrients because the plant roots can reach some mineral soil, unlike the other peatlands we've talked about. Um, and it's also going to be really diverse. We can have a bunch of different trees that can form swamps, um, or we can have these tall shrubby uh, swamps and underneath them, as far as indicators are concerned, is the fact that we have a diversity of shrubs and often different herbaceous species. Now, sometimes we'll see some grasses in there um, or even a lot of grasses in there, but often we'll see a bunch of different species of, of forbs and wildflowers and things like that present in swamps. Or in a very, very dark swamp, Sometimes it's just nothing but feather mosses under there because there's not enough light for there to be many other plants growing. So again, highly diverse uh, areas that we call swamps. So here's a picture of a shrubby swamp. Um, and again, now uh, we talked about shrubby fens. So shrubby fens, shrubs are below shoulder height, shrubby swamps, and we're talking about taller, taller shrubs mostly going to be willows as well as uh, river alder and sometimes some birches. And depending on the swamp we're talking about, we could have a different, a number of different trees present and, and forming uh, the main canopy. We have black spruce swamps, kind of similar to a bog, but the trees are much taller and denser. We can have white spruce and or tamarack forming swamps. Again, tamarack more like a fen, but again, tall, dense tamarack would turn that into a swamp. Balsam poplar can grow in swamps. Birches, especially Alaska or white birches. Willows, as we mentioned, river alder, as well as others. Um, when we have very old, mature tree swamps, uh, we're going to see the trees extremely dense and then we get these really shady conditions. Um, this is where we get the idea of the scary and mysterious swamps coming from. Um, and we do see some very unusual uh, plants, animals and fungi that you grow and live in these kinds of ecosystems. Um, where we tend to find swamps in Alberta, um, we tend to see them in the northern parts of Alberta on the edges of the water bodies or edges of peatlands. Um, and a cool thing about swamps, as far as when you do a dig and in the swamp, if you have peat present, often you're going to see a lot of wood in that peat because again, we have lots of trees and shrubs growing in there. So very high percentage of woody material and then a lot of moss is often present too in that peat. So what are some issues around swamps? Um, well, swamps are fairly common. Um, a lot, like in your developed areas of Alberta, we actually see a lot of swamps, especially a lot of shrubby swamps. The average, you know, area around a farmer's field, when you see a low area and you see those tall shrubs, you know, tall willow patches, those will all be swamps. Um, but the problem is that they are going to be transitional to upland. So trying to define the edge of the swamp is a little bit more challenging than a lot of other wetlands. And um, 
like uh, we mentioned before, in these treed wetlands, we often don't have water visible for uh, very long or if at all during the growing season. So people don't necessarily think of them as being a wetland. When we're thinking about forestry, swamps are often producing our very tallest, biggest trees. So they are gonna be sort of targeted if possible for harvesting especially where we have species like white spruce or um, balsam poplar, that sort of thing. Um, but when we have those trees removed, um, we typically see the, those trees were actually reducing the water levels significantly by the fact that they were absorbing all that water out of the soil. So when we log them, they become flooded. And so then um, we're gonna have them not recover for many, many, many years um, because we'll get just grasses coming in and taking over and the water will be too deep um, for there to be good tree growth. And so then these areas go from being this, this beautiful swamp to just being a grassy patch in the forestry uh, or in the, uh, the forest cup lock, which is unfortunate. And this is another problem and, and that has to do with swamps. And that is, okay, so I know this is looking scary for everyone that looks at this, but this is called the edotopic grid. This is how we classify ecosystems when we're doing um, ecosystem classification and mapping projects. And the, um, what we're going here is on this scale, we're going from driest to richest. And then for nutrients, we're going from poorest to richest. Here, so dry, or driest to wettest, I should say. So xeric being very dry, hydric being there is water over the surface for most of the year. And, um, and then the nutrients going from poor to rich. So the problem is, what is a swamp? Well, um, and what is a wetland? Well, we generally draw the line at seven, all right? So a nutrient regime of hydric is where we draw the line right across there. So what are swamps? Swamps are G's, H, and F's, um, G's, H's, and F's. What do you notice here is that they cross the line between being wetland and non-wetland. And so generally when ecosystem classification is done before these projects go in, these swamps are often not recognized because you know, they exist on the border between wetland and not wetland usually. All right, so that's swamps. Now we're gonna go into our last two wetland types. Um, and so these, those are the marshes and shallow open water wetlands. So marshes are mineral soil wetlands always. They're gonna be very, very high in nutrients because plant roots are in the soil and we often have water movement happening too. Um, what we're gonna see is vegetation in marshes is a huge diversity depending on how the wa permanent the water is of uh, various grass or grass-like species, grasses, sedges, rushes, etc. Cattails and bulrushes are common in our more semi-permanent marshes, but you go to less permanent marshes and we're gonna see lots of other different grasses and, and rushes and things. Um, by definition, they can't have a significant amount of cover of trees or shrubs. Um, what the, the line is depends on which classification system you, you use. Could be 6%, it could be 25%, depending on, on who you're asking. If you have more trees or shrubs, then you move to a swamp. Um, so some cool facts about marshes. They are extremely important for birds and a huge diversity of birds. They provide food and habitat and place to nest. So a lot of species are only living in, in marshes. Things like um, soras and snipes and bitterns live ex pretty much exclusively in, in, in marshes. Um, all the shorebirds, there's like many species of shorebirds like sandpipers and plovers and stuff. They are finding their whole lives in marshes. Um, and then other ones live in the vegetation like red-winged blackbirds and various sparrows and wrens in the open water areas um, and or in vegetated areas for nesting areas. We have ducks, grebes, and loons living in there. 
We have geese and swans nesting in there. And yeah, so there's a huge diversity of birds that live in marshes and they are probably for birds, the most important kind of wetland in Alberta. Um, also see a lot of other animals that people think are really cool, things like frogs and toads and salamanders and muskrats and mink and moose and lots of bugs. Um, so they are very important for that way for habitat. Um, another thing is beavers give, are often given a bad rap because they create, um, you know, their dams and they create these wetlands, but those actually end up long-term helping the ecosystems that you find them in. Um, and so when you see a stream that's blocked by uh, a beaver and now creating a, a marsh area or a shallow open water area, it's actually benefiting that stream, benefiting water quality. Um, even though you may not want to drink that water right in the marsh, it's, it's doing just like you wouldn't want to eat the sponge, all right? Uh, you don't want to eat the liver, all right? Because it's what's doing the cleaning, all right? So, um, but they are very valuable. And of course, when we don't have the marshes, those animals just can't exist. Marshes are under threat in Alberta, mostly because we see uh, the majority of our marshes more towards the southern part of the province, and that's where the people are too, and where agriculture is. So farmers are draining them. Um, we got housing and, ag and uh, other developments. Um, people damaging them to make their quote unquote nice lake shores, uh, people quadding along them or using motor boats and, and causing significant wave action that helps that degrades marshes. And of course, people wrecking beaver dams and then destroying those marshes that the beavers have so kindly created for us. All right, last but not least, we have our shallow water wetlands. So they like, they are very similar to marshes, um, but uh, basically we have a higher percentage of the area that has water or at least like a muddy area that isn't got, that doesn't have plants coming out of the water, what we call emergent vegetation. So we will have less than 25%. That's where we draw the line between a marsh and a shallow open water. Um, if we have more than 25% plant cover, we call it a marsh. If we have less than 25 emergent plant cover, we call it a shallow open water. Um, so we will often see a lot of plants under the surface here. So when you look carefully, you'll see that there is much more diversity than you see coming out of the water. Or we can see things like duckweeds uh, floating on the surface of the water. Uh, where we tend to see them most commonly in our area is along lake shores, in streams, or in areas that beavers have flooded. And um, for the same reason that we just talked about with marshes, um, you know, these are also under a, a fairly high degree of threat. Some cool uh, facts about shallow open waters. Um, they are really important for a bunch of species and especially for our fish. Um, so where our fish are going to be breeding and having their nursery areas where they can live when they're little, um, that's going to be in the shallow open water zones at the edges of lakes. All right, so if we start to clear that vegetation, we start to degrade our shallow open water wetlands. Now we don't have nursing areas, nursery areas for our fish that are safe places for them to grow up. And so we can see a corresponding decline, unfortunately, in our fish populations. Of course, a disturbance of these areas also usually corresponds with more people on the lake and fishing in the lake. So then we get a double hit of our fish of losing their nursery habitat as well as losing um, their numbers from overfishing. And a lot of the, even a lot of the, if the adults are dependent on species of insects and whatnot that are living in these shallow water areas that form the basis of the food chain in much of the open water of the lakes because yeah, the open water of the lakes, if you go into there, you don't see a lot of larger critters around, right? Those are in the shallow open water areas um, that are providing the base of that food chain. So some shallow open water issues. Generally, we see them much well, 
much better recognized than other ones because we got water present for a good chunk and it's nice and visible. But in agricultural areas, they are destroyed. Again, they're often lost when we have beaver dams um, being destroyed. And along lake fronts, when we have people cleaning up the weeds to make it nicer for boating, when we are creating nice beaches, causing sedimentation into the water that's gonna degrade these areas. Um, when we do quote unquote shoreline stabilization projects like we, we see in this picture down here where you throw a bunch of rocks or like Lacklavish County did in the past, putting these big metal barriers in the water, right? That's all affecting the health of our shallow open water wetlands. And an important thing to, to keep in mind, um, now that we've covered all five wetland classes, is that very often when you are out and looking at wetlands, it's not a single kind of wetland that's present. They're gonna be in complexes where you have maybe a shallow open water area and a marsh area and a swamp area. And so often we'll see um, that happening. And so we call them wetland complexes. Often we're gonna see peatlands mostly complexing with other peatlands and mineral soils often um, mostly correspondent or complexing with other mineral soil wetlands, but we do see wetlands where we get both mineral and, um, and peatland type presence. So I went out and I took a bunch of pictures and some of these I actually did steal from online, but but mostly here, these are pictures from Laclabish that I went out on Sunday and took. So now you guys get to go out or get to do the quiz and see how much you've learned here. All right, so we're gonna do polls for each of these. So answer your polls, make sure you get your answers in in time and we're gonna see how many you get right. Um, so. I haven't done a poll exactly this way, so I'm hoping it will all work fine. Um, so now I have to find my poll. I think I have to change my view here. Just, just give me a, a second here. Oh. All right, I'm just gonna change this for a second change my view and I'm gonna stop this. Sh oh, actually I do polls there, ha ha. Okay, there we go. So we're gonna go to our first one here. All right, so you're gonna put down your choice. You can only choose one. So on all of these, if you think you see more than one, go with the one that's kind of central and most dominant. Okay, so what kind of wetland or is this a wetland? And this is as you drive into Young's Beach here. All right, so I'm gonna launch the polling, put in your answer. What kind of wetland do you think it is? And I'll, I'll give you a clue, it has mineral soil. All right, and I'm gonna close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. All right, and I'm gonna end the poll here. So the results are, we have uh, one person thinks it's not a wetland, we have two people think it's a swamp, and two people that think it's a marsh. So diversity of answers, okay. Cattail plants, all right, cattail plants and rushes. So we are in a wetland and we don't have tall shrubs and we don't have tall trees. We have just these grassy type species. So if you are one of the two people that said marsh, you get a point. All right, so this is a marsh wetland. All right, good. All right, so actually hold on a sec here. I'm gonna stop the share results. There you go. So here is the, the next one. All right, so we're seeing peaty soils here. We're seeing um, black spruce trees, and we're seeing shrubs like Labrador tea, 
present. Um, so what do we think? All right, so I'm gonna relaunch the polling here. What do you think is going on? All right, and I'm gonna close in five, four, three, two, one. Oh, we got one more person participating, great. All right, and so we'll see what people thought. So we have two people think it's a bog, one person a fen, some person a swamp, and uh, or two people a swamp and one person a marsh. So the correct answer for this one is it is a bog. All right, we got black spruce trees, we have peatland soils. Um, uh, this one might be transitioning to a fen because I can I do see some some um, uh, uh, birches in here, some shrub birches, but I probably go with a bog because you can see the peat moss down here as the dominance cover. All right, so I'll stop that. All right, so we'll go to the next one here. Okay, so you probably have driven by this spot one a few times if you live in Lac La Biche. All right, um, nice big area there. All right, so I'm gonna relaunch. All right, what do you guys think? All right, and I'm gonna close in five, four, three, two, one. All right, so we have an even divide for results here. You got two people each thinking fen, marsh, and shallow open water. So um, yeah, I'm, I would be sure that we would have mineral soil in this situation just based on the pattern of the vegetation. So unfortunately, Fen would not be correct. And then the next thing is, do we think we have 25% um, vegetation versus open water? And so I guess depending on how you marked it off um, and, and, and stuff like that, it would be a maybe a marsh. If we looked at the middle area, we could mark that out, but I think the overall wetland here would be the best as a shallow open water. So maybe give yourself half a mark if you got marsh and full marks for shallow open water. Oh, there we go. So that was your results. Okay. So we'll go on to the next wetland. All right. So we've got some tall black spruce trees, pretty dense black spruce trees. Um, we're gonna ignore the trees in the front here. Um, this is an area too you might have driven by. Um, so yeah, we got some tall dense black spruce trees. What do you think this is gonna be? All right, so I'm gonna close in five, four, three, two, one. All right, so the results are, we have one person thinking not a wetland, one person thinking a bog, and four people thinking a swamp. And it actually is an area when I've been in there that's sort of borderline swamp and bog, um, but because the, the trees are relatively tall and dense, I think probably the best one is a swamp. So there we go. But it is probably transitional to a bog. And this, this one, by the way, is uh, the intersection of the highway. Where the highway goes south there, um, kind of kitty corner to the Ramada. All right. So now let's go to the next one. 
here. So here we've got some aspen trees. We've got some grassy areas underneath it. Looks like some forbs. So what do we think? What is that one? All right, we're going to close in five, four, three, two, one. And the polling and yes, we have the majority of the people correctly saying we're not in a wetland. Um, Fen, remember that would be dominated by tamarack primarily as the main tree. Um, so there was a result. So good job. Most of you guys got that. It is not a wetland. All right, so here we go. This is an area in the, also kind of by Young Speech as you come in. If you were to dig down here, you would find some shallow peat about 30 centimeters down, I would guess. You would have peat and then mineral soil underneath that. So let's try this very grassy area. All right, so I'm gonna close in five, four, three, two, one. And so we have uh, one person thinking a bog, Three people thinking a fen and one person thinking a marsh. Uh, I said that it was 30 centimeters of peat. So to have to call it a, a, a peatland, it has to have 40 centimeters of peat, if you remembered. So we actually have to go with a mineral soil wetland. So then the one person that said marsh is the only person that got it correct. So this is a marsh. And interestingly, when I first moved to Lac La Biche, this area was a swamp with tall birch tree or tall willow trees and there are cattle in there and stuff. And they removed the willow trees and it got even wetter because the willows were helping to absorb a lot of the, the water. And so now the cows can't go in this area anymore because uh, it's generally too wet for them. So they ended up kind of shooting themselves in the foot when they cleared those willow trees. All right, let's go to the next one. So taken not far from the school. And so the question is, do we see any wetland areas in this field? Do you think you see any wetland areas in the field? So let's see what you think. All right, I'm going to close in five, four, three, two, one. And let's see what you guys said. So we have one person, not a wetland, three people think of fen, and one person thinks of marsh. All right, and the correct answer is we have a marsh. We have a little marsh right here. So if you guys are looking right there, you see a patch of reed canary grass. When you see reed canary grass, that tall, um, tall, often relatively thick, wide-leaved grass, then you know you are in a marsh situation. And it's a common agricultural species that is planted intentionally in these kind of wetter habitats as a good forage species. But unfortunately, not a great species for biodiversity. All right, so. Now, here we go. This is from taken from our lab um, last week or two weeks ago. And we see this area the student is standing in and you can see it's dominated by sedges with a few little bit of birch trees in there. And I'll give you a clue. This student, when they were walking around, the ground was moving up and down around them. 
All right, so we have a floating situation here. So let's see if you remember which one floating occurs in. All right, I'm going to close in five, four, three, two, one, and yay, everyone got it right. All right, we are in a fen. And by the way, this is in that same wetland that's kitty corner from the Ramada. It's right in the middle of that wetland that we have a spring that comes up. It's an amazing little spot, a spring that comes up in the middle of that wetland and enriches it with huge amounts of nutrients from that spring. So yeah, everyone got it right as a fen. Good job. All right, now the next one. This is another part of that same wetland complex. Um, we've got some, um, these are the bark on here tells me that we've got some tamarack, but quite, quite tall tamarack. We've also got some birch trees. Down here we see a mix of some sedges and grasses and gooseberries and uh, honeysuckles and other forbs in there. All right, so what do you guys think about this one? Oops, I just moved that in the wrong spot. All right, so let's relaunch our poll. And I'm gonna close in five, four, three, two, one. And most of you guys said swamp and we did have one person say fen and I, I applaud both of the answers because you re remember that tamarack is usually a fen species, but here they are too tall and dense for me to be think I'd be calling that a fen. Plus we have the diversity of forbs in the understory and shrubs telling me that we're in a swamp. So swamp is the best answer there. All right, here's another one not far from the uh, high school or from the um, middle school. You got this lovely little area here. And so the, the area that I'm going to be specifically drawing your attention to, of course, is a lower area here. So do you think that's a wetland or not? Gosh, that's hard. Mike's making them hard now. Okay, let's see what you guys think. All right, I'm going to close in five, four, three, two, one. And we have a mix of response, um, maybe a bog, maybe not a wetland, but the correct answer is you got three people that got it. It is a marsh. Now, how do we know it's a marsh? Well, the willow is a good clue. It tells us that when we have a willow like that in a low area, that's a good indicator that we're in a wetland. Um, also notice the color change of the grasses here. All right, so we're gonna have different species of grasses in this low area, and that's gonna be an indicator of a wetland area. I'm just gonna see how many more I have. I've got a lot more. So uh, I'm just going to skip to the last ones here because we're We've had a lot of time here already. All right, so there's there's just three here we're gonna do. So quickly on this one, and I'll give you a clue. These three are all in my yard. On my relatively small residential lot. And you can probably guess this one is a man-made wetland. Oh, I just gave it away. It is, all right. So we're gonna go with a five, four, three, two, one. Oh, only four people, okay. Um, so 
most people we have actually saying it's not a wetland and one person saying a shallow open water and the correct answer is it is a shallow open water okay it may not be claimable by public lands act as a wetland but that doesn't make it not a wetland um, so yeah it's man-made but i made a wetland all right give me some credit this this took me a long time to build and takes a lot of time to maintain too and only native plants in here at least in the water all right so the next one is in my backyard so i've got some some black spruce trees and some tamarack trees here in there and i'll give you another clue on this one when i was installing the fence here um the i i went through about 10 centimeters of mineral soil and everything else was peat underneath. It was deep, deep peat in there. So it was not fun installing that fence. All right, so what do you guys think? So I'll close in five, four. Oh, we got six people already. That's all we've gotten. So I'm going to end it here. So we got a mix of results for bog, fen, or swamp. Um, so bog is pretty close, but um, look at the tallness and the density of the trees. I'm going to go with a swamp on this one. All right. So one only person got that one right. But those that put bog, you guys are thinking along the right lines because it is black spruce dominated. All right. And um, now we'll go to the next one. So this is the ditch in my front yard. Now you know which house I live in in Young's Beach because I'm the only one that has a ditch that looks like this. All right, so launch that. What do you guys think? All right, I'm going to close in five, four, three, two, one. All right, so let's see what you guys thought. So we have three people saying marsh and also perhaps bog or not a wetland. And the correct answer is it is a marsh. All right, we've got cattails in here. And I didn't plant any of these species, but we've actually got, uh, I've actually got five different species of wetland plants that are kind of equal mixes in here as well as a number of other ones that have smaller amounts and they all just came in on their own. The only thing that happened was um, I didn't intentionally do it but the water didn't flow terribly well through the culvert um, and it kind of created a pooling area and I said let it grow, let it form a wetland. It's now cleaning the water as it moves through and so so yeah, so I created myself a little marsh in the front. All right, so now last one, last wetland. This is your last chance to redeem yourself. This is on the other side where are my neighbors. And, and uh, so yeah, so we've got this area here. What do you think is going on with that one? So I'm gonna relaunch the poll here last time all right and we're going to close poll in five four three two one all right and we have 50% uh, saying not a wetland. We have a couple people saying a marsh and some people thinking a shallow open water. All right, so I remember I said, just because a wetland is mowed, it doesn't make it not a wetland. All right, 
this has got the same water permanence as my beautiful marsh. Uh, it's just that he's more aggressive in mowing it and I let mine, I let mine get the natural vegetation in there. So this is a wetland and um, although it's not claimable of course under Public Lands Act and stuff like that, it still is performing wetland functions. So it is still a, a wetland. Um, and so uh, because we do have uh, no, no, not a lot of mud, the best answer for this one would be a marsh. All right, we don't have open water, we don't have a lot of mud. Um, so then we go with another marsh here. So there we go. So if you are willing to share, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop shame, scaring, sharing my screen here so I can see the chat. Um, so if you're willing to put your, um, your answer in here, go ahead and say how many you got correct. I got five. Oh, we got five. We got uh, Collins, it looked like he's got, <laughs> and Mel, Mel V got 11. Wow, congratulations, Mel. All right. Teacher's so, pet. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So great job, Mel. All right, so if you could um, just email me your contact information and I will send you your prize. It'll be some swag from Portage College, some cool swag from Portage College Natural Resources Program. All right, so I'm gonna um, um, uh, kind of wrap it up here. I actually just noticed now that there is some questions in here. Somebody asked what RAMSAR stands for. For I don't actually think it's an acronym. I think it's named after something, like after a person or something, if I remember correctly. Um, somebody mentioned cleaner uh, source water costs less to treat. Yeah, so then we, we that is very true. Um, somebody has mentioned, uh, is there still a peat business south of Lac La Biche? I don't know if there is uh, currently one south of Lac La Biche, but I know there is peat harvesting happening north of Lac La Biche because um, we actually did a tour there with our students a few years back. Um, Chelsea just saying that he had to go, she had to go. Um, somebody asking me, are peatlands rich in fungi? Peatlands, okay. So fungi and peatlands have a very interesting relationship. Um, as I mentioned, I did my master's in fungi and actually one of my um, fellows that was working in the lab with me was actually doing a project specifically on this. What kind of peat uh, or what kind of decomposition do we see in peatlands and what are the species of fungi that are present? Um, and we actually did find that there is a significant amount of fungi in peatlands and a real diversity of fungi. Some of them are mycorrhizal, they're, so they're associated with trees or shrubs as being associates of that. Uh, but then there's actually a lot that are just doing decomposition. And because of the acidity, bacteria don't do well with acidity. So then there's hardly any bacterial decomposition. There's some, but not a lot. Almost all the decomposition in um, bogs especially uh, are is done by, by um, by fungi. So, yeah. So any other questions before we wrap up here for the evening? Well, I hope now you guys can go out on the landscape and recognize wetlands more easily. And again, um, when you do see wetland disturbance happening, uh, just call the Alberta Environment Hotline you can just Google Alberta Environment Hotline and let them know. And uh, even if they do have permits or whatever, that's fine, they'll know about that. So, um, so of course, if it's being done by the county or something like that, you can be pretty sure that they've gone through the proper steps. Um, but uh, we've got a lot of developments that happen and, and don't go through that, unfortunately. Thank you very much for the very interesting presentation, Michael. That was uh, well worth the time. Well, good. I'm glad. And I'm sorry I went a little bit over. Um, there's so much I wanted to talk about that I already had to cut out of this presentation. So I can tell you're a little passionate. <laughs> yeah. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Very good job. Well, thank you very much. It was a long day for me, Michael. <laughs> <laughs>
So no. I can tell you, I only got five, but they wouldn't register my votes. <laughs> well, that's okay. <laughs> You're here, so maybe my vote will register when you, if you run for me <laughs> again. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a campaign. I was trying to learn. <laughs> I know. I know. It's great to see you here. Okay. Thanks, Mike. All right. Yeah, thanks a lot. That was great. Okay. That's, you're very, very welcome. All right. Well, if there's no more questions, feel free to email me or that sort of thing. But I think we'll, we'll cut her off here. So have yourself a great evening. Thank you for Cynthia for joining us all the way from the Philippines. That's so awesome to have you with us. And I hope Sir, you got something I out of it too. I learned a lot. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you for the host of this uh, webinar. Oh. Thank you for the opportunity that I was given to me. Thank oh, you. Yeah, my pleasure. All right. Well, we'll wrap it up here then. Have a great rest of your night.